there's been a very marked increase in house prices, the fastest in the whole of the UK, according to one survey. And now in the county, the average price stands at £328,000, which is £20,000 above the UK average. This is in part due to good links on roads and rails back into the capital, and these are some of the reasons that our house buyers today are moving to this beautiful county. Retired project manager Les and accountant Dorothy from Leeds in West Yorkshire already know what they want from their prospective new life in the East Anglian countryside. It would just be really nice to be in a, a bigger garden, a nicer house, um, fewer neighbours uh, and a nice country house. We had a house when we first got married which was in the country and we moved here because of the children and education. So I'm really, I suppose, trying to get back to that, to where we started. Married for more than 40 years, this couple first met down the pub after helping out some friends. Uh, we went out as a foursome to accommodate this growing passion between these two people. And after about six weeks, that passion faded uh, and we carried on. There was a very strange conversation one evening where Les said, I know we're not going out, but would you mind going out with me? Uh, which was kind of cute. Uh, he probably doesn't remember it. <laughs> Having been in their current house for 36 years, there's lots they love about where they live, particularly for proud, born and bred Yorkshireman Les. It's been the perfect place to bring up children, but time has moved on and the children are now prompting the move, as their expanding family are more than 170 miles away. We'd like to pop around for Sunday lunch, go to the pub or quiz night or something like that quality time we get with our children and grandchildren is, is quite limited and so that would be a real plus for me to be closer to them. Of course and there's the grandchildren and we have to consider them. We, we have actually promised them a, a tree house in the new house so uh, we can and may have to deliver on that. And it's going to be the best tree house you've ever seen. As well as bringing them closer to their children there's another important point to the move as Les's mother also called Dorothy will be joining them. She, she currently lives about seven miles away from us and we're looking to, in our growing years, um, we recognise the need to be closer together and to give ourselves mutual support and hopefully we'll find a place that will accommodate all our needs. Once they've found the perfect place for them all, keen gardener Dorothy Jr is looking forward to experimenting with the local flora. Things that grow really well here just actually don't like it down there at all. So it's a new, a new challenge for me to learn how to grow things and what, what will grow well and how, what I can do and how I can do it. So that would be really exciting. And when it comes to enjoying their new life, sports fan Les is the man with the plan. Sport, of course, has this added benefit. It's a great intro to meeting new people. The two best places for making new friends are pubs and sports clubs and they're two of my most favourite places to visit. So I'll be actively looking for sports clubs, tennis clubs, golf clubs, um, football clubs. So Ipswich Town, watch out. <laughs> Les and Dorothy want to be closer to family in Hertfordshire and London, so the Suffolk borders seem a perfect choice that will also give them a chance at that country life thereafter. But before we start our search, we're going to find a good spot in the area to talk about what exactly they have in mind. Welcome to Suffolk. Good morning, Alistair. Les, are you already missing Yorkshire? Um, You're having withdrawal? No, I've heard it's raining, so I'm not missing it at all. Because <laughs> this is a big move. You know, you've been in your house, how was it, 30-odd 30 30, years? 36 years. Right. So it's a big move for the both of you, and particularly because you're a very loyal Yorkshireman. I am a die-in-the-wall Yorkshireman, yes. And in terms of the house, what are you looking for? Run me through the kind of spec again. Large garden, quarter of an acre to a third of an acre. Large country kitchen. Dorothy, if you want to chip in. I think the only thing I'd add to that is that a non-suite bedroom. I've always wanted a non-suite bedroom. And how many be bedrooms in total? Uh, minimum two. More than that would be lovely. But you also need to have accommodation for your mum, is that right? Uh, yes. I intuitively feel it would be better were it detached from the house. And that sounds awful, I know, but I'm thinking about... Maintaining our independence. And hers. And hers. And hers. Mm -hmm. OK, so that does make it a bit more complicated, because uh, your budget is... Remind me of your budget. 
500,525 at a real push. Right. Okay, so we always take the highest, so yeah, 525. <laughs> Don't go um, over that. What about style? Are you looking for an old property or something new? When I started looking, I just realised that the modern houses don't really work. And I, I'd really like... And I even said at the first, whatever I do, I'm not having a thatched cottage. And then I started looking and thinking, oh, they're really cute. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, anything, really. We, we're open to any style at all. Well, we've got some lovely properties and uh, they are waiting for us. So shall we get in the car? Well, let's do it. Let's. Suffolk will win you over, I can feel it. <laughs> With a top budget of £525,000, Les and Dorothy are looking for a detached property with a large country kitchen and at least two bedrooms, one of which should have an ensuite. They'd also like a large garden for Dorothy to make into a gardener's paradise and there must be somewhere on site for Les's mother to live independently. We have three promising properties for Les and Dorothy to view, but it'll only be after they've seen each one that its price will be revealed. And we'll see who gets the better deal at our mystery house. Our search begins in the village of Bressingham, not far from Thetford Forest Park. It's a very picturesque village and even comes complete with its own narrow gauge steam railway. There's also a village hall with an active social calendar, a grade one listed church believed to date back more than a thousand years and a village shop that sells homemade local produce. And as it happens, our first house is only a stone's throw away. Here we have it, house number one. What do you think? It's pink. It's pink. We like pink. And it's thatched. And it's thatched. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Suffolk pink. So a classic Suffolk house. I mean, it's really a oh, classic Suffolk cottage. It is. Um, from the 17th century, but it's got a great big pitched roof because it's got another room up there. Oh, wow. Excellent. The first impressions, absolutely look wonderful. Mm. Great. What about you, Dorothy? It looks enormous. <laughs> I've lost the words, really. <laughs> but you're not freaked out by the thatch? No, I'm coming round to understanding how that actually works, and most people who have them say they're very warm. Yeah. Tremendously warm, very green, environmentally friendly. Yeah. And this one's actually been done relatively uh, recently, like maybe 10 odd years ago. Let's have a look inside. <laughs> okay. There's no separate annex with this Grade 2 listed timber framed house, but it does have a side entrance to the property that I'm keen to show our couple first off so they can start thinking about Les's mother. Come on in. Back into the 17th century. Oh, oh wow. Look at that. That's quite a snug. We were thinking this, with its own entrance, this might be a good sort of living space for Dorothy yes, Senior. Yes, actually. It's about the right size. Okay. Yeah, that mm -hmm. would work. Because through here is what they use as the utility room, but it could um, equally it be is, yeah. a shower, well, it is already a bathroom in there, but this could be a kitchenette. Excellent. No, no, this is cosy. I, I could see my mother in here. This is what we were thinking about for your mum. Yeah. But let's go and see your living quarters. OK. Mind your head here, that's one of the okay. lintels. How many little sides are So this would be your sitting room. Wow. It's quite homely. And good size for, the, for you guys? Oh, I think so, yeah. Because we've also got a kitchen and dining area at this end. Oh, right. OK. So this end has this oh. dining room that flows into through these desegregated walls uh -huh. into the kitchen. OK. Uh, it's not massive, is it? Okay. It's... it's... The dining room's wonderful. I can see Christmas. I can see fires mm -hmm. blazing. I can see the family sat around the table. And it's just a tad small in here. It's been ticks everywhere so far. It's just kind of half tick. For the half floor. a tick. Well, upstairs we have five bedrooms. Oh, good. Let's go and look at the master bedroom. Yes. There are two further floors to this house as the roof space has been converted into a large attic room with a separate bedroom complete with its own stairway. One storey down, the first floor has three additional bedrooms, including this good-sized double, a more narrow single, and a smaller room currently used as an office. The large Jack and Jill-style family bathroom can be used to access the master, which is our next destination. This is what they're using as the master bedroom. Fireplace here, 
-hmm. and a little, sadly not an ensuite, but a little airing cupboard there. Right. And as often happens in these old buildings, upstairs is a little wonky. <laughs> so I don't think there's a true or straight uh, floor anywhere upstairs. It doesn't feel too wonky. Yeah. I've seen worse. What are, you, what are your thoughts? <laughs> I, um, okay. Off the top of my head, it looks a little small. Shame that's not an ensuite. It looks like it is, doesn't it? It's a tease. It does, <laughs> yeah. It's tempting, but not. Let's look outside. Okay. The house sits in just under half an acre of land, with the front facing south. There's also a separate double garage in matching Suffolk pink. And at the back, there's a large, mature garden with a variety of fruit trees and a vegetable patch. Plenty to keep Dorothy's green fingers busy. It's a fairly substantial garden. Is it sort of sizable enough for you? Yeah, I think it's it's workable. Uh, my only concern is it's the back is north facing, which might be an issue. I'd have to work out where the sun was going to be. But there's a shed for you, dear. Yes, a shed, a whittling shed. A whittling shed. Yes. <laughs> it's very nice. It's beautiful. Uh, what about the price? What do you think this is on the market for? Uh, I would say four nine nine. That's optimistic. I would say top end of budget, at least five ten. Very good. Well, in this case, your your husband is, is a better gauge. Really? It's actually on the market at five hundred thousand pounds. Wow. So um, it's a big property. There's lots of yeah. rooms. I mean, whether it's going to work for you inside, I suggest that you go and have another review of all the rooms, and uh, then we can meet at the front and talk about what happens next. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Comfortably under Les and Dorothy's budget of £525,000, this 17th century period property comes with five possible bedrooms, an attic room, and a generous snug that could be converted for Dorothy Senior's use, as well as a double garage and a large garden. Oh, wow. Oh, I know two little boys who love this. <laughs> it's great. What is it? What can I do? <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's oh, strong. That's the roof. It's hard not to like this house. As soon as you walk up the drive, it, it's just beautiful. I think the big plus for me with this is it's quite spacious and it seems very light. I think in terms of my mother, the, the space just won't work here for us, um, which is a great pity because the rest of the house is absolutely perfect. It's a great first house. I'm wondering whether Dorothy Senior, Liz's mum, is going to... Uh find it quite convenient living in the same space. I guess we're about to find out. Hello, everybody. Hello. Finished. So I was just talking about your mum and whether she would fit in here, but uh, we can discuss that in the car because we're heading on to house number two. OK. East Anglia has some of the best farming land in England facts borne out by increases in the value of prime arable land here in recent years. And Suffolk's beautiful countryside in particular has a rich agricultural heritage. Cereal crops, sugar beet and oilseed rape may be big business, but at the other end of the spectrum, smaller producers tending fields of colourful flowers for the burgeoning freshly cut market are flying the flag for homegrown flora. With this in mind, we've sent Dorothy and Leslie to meet Francis Boscowan, at a farm near Dennington. So what kind of soil do you have here and what flowers grow well? It's quite heavy soil, um, so I have to put in lots of compost to lighten it yeah, up, yeah. but it means it's really a good fertile soil, so that is a good thing. Um, and once things are established, they do really well. Things that grow well here, um, well, these roses, the dahlias, um, all the perennials. I, I think um, the annuals would like a slightly lighter soil. How many species do you have here, and what's your favourite? Oh, probably 40 different species, and um, at the moment, I think the roses are my favourite. What would you suggest the best plants we should grow? Well, you could have, a, like, a cutting garden and, the, and Ooh, that'd be nice. um, pick everything, mm. you know, for, for your house, like yeah. I do. Just have your own cutting garden. Excellent. And that's easy in maintenance, is it? Well, it's just like growing vegetables, really. Oh, okay. So, if you like growing vegetables, oh, yes. I don't know if you do. No, no, yeah, we do. Yeah. Um, just have an extra row on the end. The UK's own flower market has become a shadow of its former self, at only around 10% of the size it was during its 1970s heyday. 
imported flowers have often been treated in some way to help them survive the journey. The big advantage of locally grown flowers is that they're as fresh as they can possibly be, often picked that very morning. These are sweet williams, these are cornflowers, and these are ammy. So this species, how difficult is it to get them to grow and flower when you want them to? Well, these are biennials. I grow them from seed, and I'll sow these seeds now for next year. These were grown last year. These are annuals, um, so they can either be grown from seed at the beginning of this year, or in fact, these were all grown from last autumn. And I've planted them all together so that they're all flowering at the same time. Frances has been growing flowers on her Suffolk plot for four years now, and her beds stretch across about two acres. And she has an expert tip when it comes to picking. So if you just cut quite low down right. on a flowering stem, mm -hmm. don't worry too much. Flowers take water up overnight, so cutting the flowers low down and early in the morning helps with water retention, making the cut flowers last longer. Largely self-taught, flower arranging has been a passion that Francis has long cultivated. And so with their cut flowers gathered, Dorothy and Les are about to get some expert tuition in this ancient art. There's records right back to the Egyptians, um, flower arranging, um, and the Ch ancient Chinese dynasties. And then you get the okay. Dutch masters um, with the beautiful tulips, the sort of still life paintings of tulips. And that style of flower arranging is very kind of popular at the moment. Do you arrange flowers from one direction or to I, th I think you want directions. to be able to see them all the way around, okay. really. So I think when you're using lovely fresh things like this, it just looks very natural. They're you know, it, it's flowers. flowers in a jug, but, but it's, it's quite a skill when you're doing an arrangement to, to also get that very natural look. It certainly seems like a very creative pastime, and I think I can see Lairs in particular starting to bloom. Let's hope this continues as we get back to our house hunt. Our property adventure continues as we make our way to the village of Heckfield Green. Local legend has it that the nearby country village of Hoxton was where King Edmund of East Anglia hid under Goldbrook Bridge after his defeat by the Danes in around 870 AD, until he was found and taken prisoner for refusing to renounce his faith, a scene commemorated at the village hall. The village also has a charming local shop, a friendly pub, and an old phone box that's been converted into a book exchange. House number two is a mere five minutes drive away from the village centre. There's a pink house over there, but it's the white house that the we're looking house. at. Now, what are your thoughts about the outside? Well, it looks quite substantial. It's obviously had pieces added on, so I'd be interested to see how they've done that. It's intriguing, it's, it's nice, it's square. Um, I can't tell much more from the outside. Well, unlike the first house, which had amazing curb appeal, <laughs> I think this one, you know, perhaps the outside could be spruced up, but I think inside it's going to offer you perhaps more to play with. OK. So should we look inside? Yeah. Please. Yeah, let's Despite an external facade that's very different to our first house, this corner property is also believed to date back to the 17th century. But I'm sensing Dorothy and Les aren't quite convinced of its charm just yet. Let's go straight into the kitchen. I think this is going to be, well, certainly a very different offering. Ooh, yes. Now, this is a dining kitchen. <laughs> is this where you want it? Yeah. This is a country that. kitchen. Yeah. It's kind of what you imagine when you think of a, a dining kitchen, so... Well, what's nice, because I remember when, this morning when you were saying, oh, you, you might really like a kind of dining kitchen that opens out into a sunroom. Yes. And into the garden, <laughs> which is really another sitting room. Right. On the back of the house. There's, there's a little snug here and then a more formal sitting room this way. OK. Passing through the snug area, we arrive in the main living space. Here we have the... what they're using as the sitting room. It's nice and light, isn't it? But I feel that I'm not quite getting what you're, what you're feeling about this house, whether you like it or you don't like it. Just I, feels I, a bit I, stark mm. somehow. It's a lovely house, it's a nice location, but it's just got... A lumpy feel to it. <laughs> it's a bit like a snail, isn't it? It sort of goes in a, in yeah. a sort of spiral. Yeah. The reason we brought you here is because it just makes a lot more sense in terms of like the layout, the space. Um, we've got an option outside for a, an annex. For, we wondered about that. For yeah. And upstairs also is a much, much more logical layout. Okay. 
The rest of the ground floor holds the family bathroom with bath and shower, as well as this small office space in what used to be a second entranceway. Upstairs, we have a large double bedroom and a smaller double with original exposed timber beams, as well as a third room currently used for storage. But it's the master I want to show our couple next, as it has something very high on Dorothy's list. There are four bedrooms on this floor. Well, there's only this floor. Four bedrooms <laughs> on this floor. This is the biggest. And it does have very nice ensuite. Oh, good. Got some steps for the big bathtub. Excellent. It's a nice big room. Is there That's any... a walk-in wardrobe. Oh, good. OK. Suddenly there's a lot of storage. There's a lot of storage, <laughs> yes. That's fine. Cool. Big, square, roomy. I like this room. I think it's mm. very nice. So you're both very quiet and still. <laughs> yeah. I don't know whether that's just a Yorkshire thing or whether no, you're just... No, not at all. I'm just wondering where Mum's going to go. Ah, good point. Follow me. Sitting next to the main house, there's a decent-sized outbuilding that used to be a double garage that could be converted into a dwelling if Les and Dorothy are up for the challenge, with the right planning permission, of course. Come on in. Wow. So this, we're imagining, is uh, your conversion... Potential. Right. New yeah, I think the footprint's big enough. The present owner had a microbrewer in here, so there's, there's plenty of uh, water mm. and drainage okay. and electricity. I mean, is this what you were thinking of when you were doing yes. talking about a converting Very an much outhouse? So, yeah. yeah, it's got potential. Great. Well, let's step outside and talk about the price and okay. the garden. Okay. Outside, the enclosed garden faces south, which is good news for Dorothy's horticultural plans. From the back here, you get a, a kind of better idea of the layout of the two properties together. Yes. Plenty of grass to cut, that's for sure. <laughs> um, yes, it's not exactly bursting with um, flowers. Put our stamp on the garden, that's yep. easy. What do you think the price of this one is? I think 420. I would say 480. Okay. So, yes, you're again, once again, uh, more accurate. It's on at 485. Right. So, 485,000 mm. pounds. Yes, you seem a bit ambivalent about it. Not jumping I've, for joy. I'm more excited about converting the little um, garage, to be honest. I could get quite excited about doing that. Um, well, have a wander around, see if you can get excited about the house where you're going to live. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll see you at the front. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Coming in well under budget at £485,000, this 17th century property comes with four bedrooms, a large country kitchen, a good-sized garden, and a separate outbuilding ripe for conversion for Leslie's mother. I think the annex part of it is perfect. We could, we could really work with that and make it into a really nice space for mother-in-law. But there was just something... Uh, didn't get that nice, comfy, cosy feeling when I walked through. It was like there was something missing, but I couldn't quite tell you what it was. I think we could make my mother's bit really nice. But for, for us, I think there'd be a lot of work involved. So come on, Team Yorkshire, we're all done here. We can pack up our bags, head back okay. to the ranch. Right. Get ready for our mystery house tomorrow. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> Our Suffolk Borders Odyssey continues as we're helping Les and Dorothy from Leeds in West Yorkshire find their own little slice of country life with a budget of £525,000. Not forgetting they need room for Les's mum too. Still to come, our mystery house causes quite a stir. Excuse me, I'll take my jaw off the floor. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's amazing. I'm, I'm waiting for the book. There has to be a book. And I'll be visiting a Suffolk farm where everyone pitches in. Hello, kids. Oh, yes. Aww. Day two of our property search here in Suffolk with our quietly spoken Yorkshire couple. And it's going to be an interesting mystery house, because remember, this is not just a property for Les and Dorothy, but also for Les's mum. And the Mystery House gives Dorothy Senior a great annex, but the compromise is will the main house please our couple? Let's find out. And what do you think we might show you for the Mystery House? I guess it could be a barn conversion. It could be a church or a school conversion. 
could be a big manor house that's divided up into sections. Um, but somehow I have a sneaky feeling it's none of those. Mm. <laughs> For our final property destination, we're heading to the small village of Mettingham on the southern tip of the beautiful Norfolk Broads. The nearby historic market town of Bungay has been holding regular weekly markets since 1382, a tradition that continues to this day every Thursday by the Buttercross. The town also has its own castle, built by the Earl of Suffolk in around 1163, and now open to visitors, complete with tea room and gift shop. Our mystery house is less than 10 minutes' drive away. Oh! Ta da! Oh, look at this! Little oh, house! Oh, oh, boy! Yeah! Oh! I think you've rung a few bells there. So, the mystery is. Well, the mystery is that we're giving your mum a really lovely house. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> I'm sure she'll be very as happy. As you can see, we've got a fantastic annex here. And a fantastic old thatched, 500-year-old cottage. Uh -huh. Lots and lots of outhouses, about an acre of uh, land. Wow. It's a whole kind of package. Right. Excuse me while I'll take my jaw off the floor. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's, what do you think? Cement. I'm, I'm waiting for the butt. There has to be a butt. Well, there isn't really a butt in the sense that it's unlike the other properties where we've always slightly struggled to where to put your mum. <laughs> yeah, here, oh. here it's sort of even Stevens. Amazing. So let's go and look at where your mum might live. OK. This property is the oldest house we're showing Les and Dorothy, dating back around 500 years. It has a thatched roof and the walls are a mixture of cob and brick. But we're going to tear up the rule book as we're leaving the main house for the time being and making the annex our first stop. Here, yeah, this is a bit more like it, is it? Oh, wow. This is good. Yeah, I'm a bit speechless, really. It's everything. Everything that we would want. There's plenty of room. Well, we would want. She, she likes want. space. What do you think Dorothy Senior will think of this? I think it, she'd love it. I think it's perfect. The thing that strikes me is if we'd have sat down and planned something and designed it from the ground up, this is more or less what we would have done. So this is perfect, absolutely perfect. So the big question is, will the house be perfect for you two? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Let's go and look. Yes. This annex was added in 1983 and has a large double bedroom, modern shower room and its own separate garden with pond. As we head to the main house, I'm hoping our couple will be just as impressed by what they find there. So Hi. here things get a little bit more tight. Yeah. To me, as a rank amateur, it looks a very nice cosy kitchen. Um, it's not quite the country kitchen I had in mind, but it's very nice, no question about it. Speaking as the chief cook and bottle washer, um, and a left-handed cook at that, it flows the right way for me. So, yeah, no problem with that. I presume the utilities are somewhere else, the washing machine. Yes, on the other side of this wall, there's a sort of garden room, sort of like conservatory. So this is an addition through that rather lovely arch. Uh, we're going into the cottage, and there the beams are quite low. Right. So mind your heads. We're going back in time. We're going back in time. Passing through the rather grand dining room, we make our way to the living room. So this is the sitting room. Amazingly big, ancient beams. It's amazing that it's not listed, actually, this building. But, yes. um, but it's not a huge room. But uh, it's got a lot of features. Yeah, it's about but as it... big as our front sitting room. It's nice, it's quirky. Now, upstairs, there's only two bedrooms in this building. Right. Property. So One each. One each. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they are historic. Oh, OK. Mind your head. OK. So lean forward until you see the round mirror. There you are. OK. <laughs> Upstairs, the smaller bedroom is currently used as a single. It has a sloping ceiling and exposed beams mirror the rest of the house. Immediately next door, there's a cosy but modern family bathroom, leaving us with only one room left to explore. This is uh, what's used as the Ooh. master bedroom. Oh, nice big room. Yes, I think the bedroom is certainly bigger than the one we have now. So you've got two bedrooms here. I mean, you mentioned that two would be enough if, as long as there was one for your mum. Yes. Um, I'm just thinking if we have our kids and the grandkids over, somebody's on the sofa, but... Um... Well, there are quite a lot of summer houses. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you could actually, you know, make those watertight and Camping. Heating. Yeah. They could camp out. You could, there's plenty of land. You can certainly yeah. camp out. Yeah. 
Anyway, so that, that's, the, that's the deal of the Mystery House. You've got a, you've got a historical, quirky, 500-year-old mm. cottage and a modern, quite spacious annex. Yes. It's really interesting. It's so different, you need to think about it. Well, let's go outside and think about it. <laughs> okay. This property sits in about one acre of land and is surrounded by rolling countryside. The large plot includes several different sheds and outbuildings, and the garden itself features a selection of fruit, trees and shrubs. There's also a separate double garage currently used as a workshop. It's really nice the sun comes out. It's certainly a, a sun trap, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So what are your thoughts about the garden? But yeah, it's, it's a nice space. Like I can see lots of things I'd want to do with it. Yeah. There's certainly a scope for a tree house in one of the trees. Oh, so sure, that, yeah. That's good. Yeah. OK, so how much do you think this is all worth? Oh, five ten. I would say five hundred and five. Because you're pinched five hundred and ten. <laughs> well, in this case, you're both wrong. Because ah. this is actually on the market for four hundred and seventy-five thousand pounds. Whoa! Really? Amazing. So have a good wander around, okay. and uh, when you've seen everything you want to, then I'll meet you at the gate, and we can press on. Okay. Lovely. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Very good. Again, coming in well under budget at £475,000, this thatched cottage comes with two bedrooms, two reception rooms, a very large garden, and of course, that separate annex perfect for Dorothy Senior. Oh, -ho. this is a lovely workshop, isn't it? Isn't it perfect? I'm afraid you just might lose me for days. Good. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, oh, the moan in terms of the garden. I have reservations about the main part of the house. I think it would need some development work to kind of open it out and to make it feel a bit more airy. And, but then again, the prices allows that in the budget. So there is the, the possibility of doing that. It, it's amazing. I didn't expect anything like this. It feels like it's just dropped out for fairy tale. The fact that it's, it's not very big as a main house and it only has two bedrooms is a bit of a concern. But thinking about why a, part of why we're moving is to be close to our children so that we don't necessarily have to accommodate all of them all the time. Oh, look at you two. Oh. Like a picture in your what new in home. Country cottage. <laughs> <laughs> right, it's not yours yet, so let's go and gather our thoughts. OK. okay. The majority of Suffolk farms are medium to large enterprises covering hundreds of hectares and producing thousands of tonnes of crops each year. However, not all the farms in this agricultural county are producing for the commercial end of the market. On 12 acres of land just outside Ipswich, a new model of farming is being pioneered by a group of committed locals. The Oak Tree Farm is Suffolk's first community-supported agriculture scheme, a not-for-profit social enterprise where volunteers get their hands dirty and share the risks and rewards of farming. I've come to meet owner and former IT engineer turned farmer Joanne Mudder. We're a community supported agriculture scheme so the way we do community supported agriculture is our members, we have about 50 households who are members of the farm and they come along and work, we all work together on producing the vegetables and then we share out the harvest each week equally between everybody. How egalitarian. <laughs> That's wonderful. Who came up with this idea? Is this your baby? The farm is my baby. I didn't come up with the idea of community-supported agriculture. There, is actually, there are actually several schemes around the country and a network, the CSA network. Um, but the way we do it, yes, that was really something that evolved within our community. It has all good ideas. It started around a pub table uh -huh. about six years ago, and it's evolved from there. What was the soil like when you moved here? Absolutely appalling. Oh, really? It was like a child's sandpit. There were no earthworms in it. It was literally the colour of sand. And as you can see, it's now become the colour of, sort of milk chocolate. We want to make it to dark chocolate colour. That's our aim. Is that the goal? Absolutely. Members of the scheme sign up for a year and pay a weekly amount of about £9. 
which gets them a vegetable box for a commitment of about two hours a week in the summer months and one hour in the winter. So what do you do with pest, pest control? Because I see you've got a bit of black fly. We have got a bit of black fly, but what we tend to do is we just leave it and let nature find its equilibrium. Uh -huh. So we'll, we'll, I've been seeing a lot of ladybird larvae in there, and so they'll really enjoy the black fly. And oh, the more ladybird larvae we have, the better. Good. So obviously no fly. pesticides. We don't use any pesticides at all. And it's not just humans that work on the farm. Hello, kids. Oh, yes. Aww, so we are got you to... hungry? Are, are you hungry? Are. Would you like yeah. to feed them? Yes, they sound hungry. Great stuff. Here you go. Very good. So what's the thinking behind the pigs? Well, the pigs are, are really back, our secret weapon against oh. weeds, and they dig our ground for us. So when they moved onto this patch of ground uh, about two weeks ago, it looked like the patch over there, which oh, is really? just absolutely covered in weeds. Uh, yeah, so they're marvellous. They eat the roots. They absolutely love it. They love to dig. Tell me about your low-carbon strategies. Presumably the piggies play their role. They certainly do, um, by peeing and pooing in, onto the soil. They're adding to the organic matter of the soil, the carbon matter of the soil. And also our cows, we use a technique called mob grazing, where we keep them in a relatively small area for a short length of time, then move them really regularly. And that's a way of encouraging the grass to release carbon into the soil. And we encourage our members to lift, share, cycle, and also take it in turns to collect their vegetables for the neighbours and then drop them off rather than all drive to the farm. Joanne and her team estimate that the amount of carbon they emit through their activities is more than matched by the amount they're putting back into the soil, which would make them a rare carbon negative business. I'm interested to find out what the attraction of such a setup is, so Joanne introduces me to one of the farm's members, David Dodd. So if you were going to sell it to someone who was living nearby at Suffolk, what, what would you say was the top drawer of the farm? The top drawer of the farm is you can come out, be free and enjoy life, and especially if you're retired. It's like a supercharged allotment. Yes, but it's a very much a shared allotment. Um, I learned a lot of my growing from allotments and I found it get quite competitive. It's also an awful lot of work, you know, they reckon you need about 10 hours a week to do an allotment. And this is two hours a week in the this summer? This is two hours a week in the summer and one hour in the winter, so it's less of a commitment. What, what, what do you end up with? What do you get in your weekly veggie box? You get beans and beetroot. lettuce and beetroot and uh, cauliflowers. cauliflowers. Yep. So basically, if you think of the time of the year, the crops are out at that time, that's what you get in your, bo in your yes, box, it's basically. Yes, completely seasonal, we eat with the seasons. Yes. It seems to be an inspiring scheme, and I'm heartened to hear that projects like this are springing up all over the UK, with around 65 small community farms already up and running. I think we might be on to a winner with the Mystery House, but let's find Dorothy and Les and see what they're thinking. Hey, guys. Hi. How have we done? Have we managed to win these Yorkshire folk over to Suffolk? Absolutely. Mm. Oh, that's good. I didn't expect that, but <laughs> yes. Definitely. And how have we done with the houses? Two out of three, I think, is pretty good. Two out of three? Mm. So which ones? Uh, the first one and the last one. Oh. So tell me about me, the... Yeah. Uh, yeah, tell me about the... Because uh, you kind of... I thought you'd ruled the first one out. The challenge with it is making accommodation for Les's mum, but Les did have some fairly clever ideas yesterday about what we possibly could do. So I think it's worth looking at again. Right. And the mystery house, Les? The mystery house really had me scratching my head and reassessing my values in terms of what we were looking for. It was two big ticks in both of the garden and in terms of my mother. And I think the price is, is quite reasonable. And I think that leaves quite a bit in the budget to uh, get an architect in and a look at the house and say, look, how can we, um, how can we do things? So what happens next? What's the next stage? I think for me, I'd, I'd like to go back and see house number one and the last house, um, just to have another look round, look at the village, look at the surrounding areas. It's been a magnificent journey the last three days. And you've given us really good food for thought, river re-evaluate some of the things we've been thinking about. Well, it's been a great delight, and I hope everything sorts out and uh, that your mum makes a decision 
and likes one of our houses, but whatever happens, do stay in touch. We will. We will do that. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think we did a nifty job transplanting a fiercely proud Yorkshireman down to Suffolk. Of course, the acid test will be whether his Yorkshire mother comes willingly as well. But it seems to me that Dorothy Jr. and Les had a good time under our guiding wing. So make sure you join us for more good times on the next edition of Escape to the Country. And if you would like to... Diamond in a deep dark mine.